This episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast is sponsored in part by Law Enforcement Labor Services in Minnesota. Law Enforcement Labor Services, also known as LELS, is Minnesota's largest public safety labor union with over 7,000 Minnesota public safety members serving in all areas of public safety, law enforcement, 911 dispatch centers, corrections, public safety administrative support personnel, and firefighters. Established in 1977, LELS serves over 260 different public safety agencies and over 450 locals across the state of Minnesota. With their administration, general counsel, three staff attorneys, and 14 business agents, LELS provides contract negotiations for better wages and benefits, grievance processing and representation, discipline representation, mediation and arbitration, assistance with representation for post-board hearings, and in-line-of-duty death benefits for survivor families. Find out more about Law Enforcement Labor Services at LELS.org. LELS.org. Episodes of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast may contain strong language and violent content. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sheriff Scott Rose from Minnesota, and I'm your host for today's new episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. In each episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast, we'll share the details and the stories of how these men and women heroically lost their lives in the line of duty. Our mission is to help ensure their service and sacrifice is never forgotten. Thanks for spending some time with me today to remember and honor these fallen heroes. The state of Utah was admitted into the Union this year, making it the 45th state of the United States of America. Copper statue of Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty, was gifted by the French to the U.S. and was dedicated in the New York Harbor this year by U.S. President Grover Cleveland. The statue was named the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty, known the world over as a symbol of freedom and promise. A gift from the people of France to commemorate their country's close bonds with the colonies during the revolution, America's Lady of Liberty has stood faithful vigil in New York Harbor for nearly 70 years. John Philip Sousa wrote and composed the Stars and Stripes Forever March while on an ocean liner on his way home from vacation with his wife. 100 years later, by an act of Congress, that march would be made the National March of the United States. The year was 1896. The state of Minnesota was 38 years old. Logging, farming, and the railroads were mainstays in Minnesota's early economy during these years. Flour milling also became a huge business in Minnesota, with Pillsbury, Northwestern, and General Mills grinding over 14% of the nation's grain. The state's iron mining industry was also established back in the late 1800s, with the discovery of iron in several ranges in northern Minnesota. This ore would be shipped by railroad to Duluth and Two Harbors for shipment to the eastern United States via the Great Lakes. McLeod County is located just west of the Twin Cities Metro in central Minnesota, and it's covered with rolling hills and dotted with over 50 lakes. It was originally inhabited for thousands of years by indigenous people, including the Dakota Sioux. By 1896, the county was already 40 years old and had grown to over 17,000 residents. The centrally located city of Glencoe is the McLeod County seat. Back then, over 1,700 residents called Glencoe their home. 
One of those residents was a young man by the name of Joseph Rogers, who was born in Lake County, Illinois, and was 14 years old when his family moved to Glencoe, Minnesota. As a kid growing up, Rogers lived with his family in a home kitty corner from the location of the county jail back then, on the corner of 12th Street and Ives Avenue. Joseph worked a series of odd jobs growing up, ranging from livery boy to constable. He was a volunteer fireman, and he ended up being appointed city marshal for a time before he was elected the 16th sheriff of McLeod County back in 1894. He was 37 years young at the time. Sheriff Rogers was a 37-year-old bachelor, and he became a very popular figure in this community. The Glencoe Enterprise described him as a good dancer and a general favorite among the locals. His popularity was likely boosted by his membership and service in most, if not all, of the secret societies in the county. Now, a secret society is considered a large membership organization or an association that utilizes secret initiations and other rituals, and whose members often employ unique oaths, handshakes, or other signs of recognition. Some go as far as to incorporate secret passwords, elaborate rituals, private languages, costumes, and symbols. Today, some examples of common groups like that uh, would be fraternities, sororities, as well as benevolent organizations like the Masons and the Shriners. Back in 1896, the sheriff's name could be found on the rosters of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, the Knights of Pythias, Ancient Free and Accepted Masons, Degree of Honor, Eastern Star, Ancient Order of United Workmen, and Modern Woodmen of America. It was June of 1896. Word had spread that an elderly couple from the area who watched over the local creamery had been robbed and assaulted by a group of men that were looking for money. Reports indicated that the elderly woman had been physically abused in front of her husband. Now, the men did this in order to get the husband to tell them where he hid his money. It was a brutal assault. The Minnesota Pioneer was Minnesota's first daily newspaper. It was founded back in 1849, and it reported the horrible nature of the crime aroused the authorities to unusual exertions, and a reward of $1,200 was offered by the state for the capture of each of the robbers. One of those robbers was believed to be 24-year-old widower Henry Singmars. Now, Henry and his wife Ella grew up as kids in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. They got married and they moved to Minnesota before Ella became ill and died at the young age of 20. Within months of his wife's death, Singmars fell into the wrong crowd, according to friends and family, and it was believed he was involved in the assault, running with the group of men that robbed this elderly couple. Singmars was now a wanted man, and $1,200 back then is equivalent to over $43,000 today, a large reward even by today's standards. Law enforcement from all over the state pursued the robbers. At one point, it was thought that Singmars might have been hiding with relatives in Mendota, which is southeast of Minneapolis. Ramsey County deputies got close, but they were never able to catch Singmars before he left the area. Singmars fled and used the railroad system to travel around the country, performing odd jobs, working in the fields and lumber camps, or driving cattle. It was during this time that he met a man named Dorman Musgrove. Musgrove was a 27-year-old from Alabama that had mined coal in the Indian territories of Oklahoma and Iowa before meeting Henry Singmars in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. The two found work driving cattle in Indian Territory in northern Minnesota before they hopped on a train and headed south towards Dassel, Minnesota, where they continued heading south on foot. They were headed to Iowa with money in hand, hoping to purchase some land and start a life down there. As the two entered into McLeod County while they were headed south, a wagon pulled by a team of horses heading south to Glencoe stopped to see if they needed a ride. The wagon was driven by a local farmer who was headed to Glencoe. Musgrove and Singmars climbed into the wagon and the men continued south on Harvest Road with the farmer. It was a warm summer's day in Minnesota. Farmers were busy in the fields and tending to their animals and as this group headed south, they passed the Benjamin Matthews farm. 
Now, Matthews was a 62-year-old farmer who lived with his wife, Lydia. They were out working in his field when his dog started barking at the horse-drawn wagon the men were riding in. As the dogs approached and barked at the horses, Musgrove grabbed his rifle and he fired towards the dog, apparently to scare the dog away and stop it from spooking the horses. The bullet ricocheted off the ground near the dog. The sharp crack of the bullet buzzed by Matthews, who was working in his field with his horse, and quickly got his attention. He immediately went to the road to confront the men about shooting towards his horse. The men started to argue. Matthews upset, thinking Musgrove was shooting towards him. Musgrove arguing that he was just trying to scare Matthews' dog away. And as the verbal argument escalated, Singmars jumped off the wagon and attacked Matthews. He punched him and he knocked him to the ground. Singmars then jumped back into the wagon, and the men continued south towards Glencoe, where the farmer dropped them off. Singmars and Musgrove headed to Frank Kohler's grocery store, where they purchased food and tobacco, and they started hiking south on the brewery road south of town. Matthews had also gone into Glencoe. He did so to report the assault to the Justice of the Peace, W.C. Russell. Matthews told Russell about the assault, and a warrant for the arrest of the two men was issued. Justice Russell handed the warrant to McLeod County Sheriff Joseph Rogers. It was 6.15 p.m., June 26th, 1896. Sheriff Rogers had just finished dinner and he decided he'd head out to search for the men who assaulted Matthews. The sheriff wasn't one to carry a weapon, so before he headed out, he borrowed a pistol from one of the local businessmen in Glencoe, William Gold. William also loaned Sheriff Rogers his personal buggy to use in the search. The sheriff then set out to find his friend and deputy, Louis Link. Now, Link was a wheelwright by trade and often helped the sheriff with his duties. The word is a combination of wheel and the word right, which comes from the old English word writer, meaning a worker or shaper of wood, as in a shipwright or an arkwright. A wheelwright back in those days made and repaired wheels, like the wooden spoked wheels on a horse wagon or carriage or wheels on a stagecoach. Due to the rocky and rugged conditions of roads back then, wheels had to be made to handle rough conditions. These craftsmen also often built and repaired carts, wheelbarrows, and small wagons as well. After finding Link, the two headed south on Brewery Road in search of Musgrove and Singmars. Musgrove and Singmars were nearing the McLeod Sibley County line when they heard a horse and buggy approach from behind. Musgrove stepped off the dirt road to the east side while Singmars moved to the west. As the buggy slowed and passed between the two men, the sheriff jumped off the buggy and said, I want you two boys. Sheriff Rogers told the men that he had a warrant for their arrest. Musgrove and Singmars argued with the sheriff, insisting they had done nothing wrong. At one point, as the verbal confrontation escalated, Sheriff Rogers reached into his right coat pocket for the pistol he had borrowed from Gould. As the sheriff started to draw his gun, Singmars went to pull his own gun. It was a 44 caliber Smith & Wesson. But as he pulled it out of the holster, his gun discharged towards the sheriff's feet, causing the sheriff to flinch as he was pulling his gun, causing his gun to fire as well. The bullet entered just above the sheriff's right hip through his upper leg and exited his inner thigh. Rogers still continued to pull his gun up and pointed it at Singmars. Singmars pulled the trigger and the bullet struck the sheriff in his forearm. As the two continued dueling, Musgrove kept raising and lowering his rifle, looking back and forth at the two as they fired their weapons. He then raised his rifle, pointed it at Sheriff Rogers, and he pulled the trigger. The bullet struck the sheriff in the chest, and he fell to the ground. The exchange of gunfire likely took only seconds, and Deputy Link was still seated in the buggy. When he saw the sheriff fall to the ground, Deputy Link took off with the buggy towards Sibley County. As he was fleeing, Musgrove and Singmars fired several shots at him. Singmars then grabbed the sheriff's gun and he pitched it into the field, and the two men took off running. This gun battle took place near the farm of Carl Jentz, who was working in his field with his daughter Pauline. Now, the two had heard the gunfire, watched the sheriff fall to the ground, watched the deputy flee in the buggy, watched the two assailants flee on foot, and 
sadly chose to continue their field work instead of running over to help the sheriff. They were only about 150 yards from where the sheriff lay bleeding. Remarkably, even with his injuries, Sheriff Rogers got up and he walked to the Jenses' farm, asking for them to take him to Glencoe. Unfortunately, by the time Carl Jens went to hitch up his wagon and he returned, Sheriff Rogers had gone down again, and he passed out from the loss of blood. Sheriff Rogers died there from his injuries. Meanwhile, Deputy Link had driven south and stopped by a nearby farm. He recruited two men there to come back with him to return where he'd left the sheriff, only to find that he was already dead. Sheriff Rogers' body was placed into their buggy, and Link drove him to the Glencoe City Hall. It was approximately 8 o'clock that evening when Link arrived with Sheriff Rogers' body, and the fire bell was tolled, a signal to all the townspeople that there was an emergency. Citizens started gathering at City Hall, and it was quickly spread throughout the area that Sheriff Rogers had been killed. The locals were outraged, and officials in both McLeod and Sibley counties responded. In short time, hundreds of men joined several teams that headed out south of Glencoe in search of the two killers. In the late 1800s, railroad expansion and a series of economic crises gave rise in the U.S. to a population of transient, marginally employed workers, or TRAMPS for short. These people were typically migrant workers looking for permanent work and lodging, who were often arrested and cited with vagrancy and tramp ordinances that were designed to keep their numbers down in these communities. That night, as the army of men searched for Singmars and Musgrove, searchers checked farms, buildings, and trains in search for the shooters, taking into custody any tramps they came across. By midnight, they had 18 tramps in custody, but discovered none of these men were the shooters. While the search continued, Dr. Charles B. Day and Elmer E. Barrett examined the body of Sheriff Rogers for the coroner. They determined that the sheriff had suffered three gunshot wounds, the self-inflicted gunshot that had gone through his pelvis, downward exiting out his inner thigh, and then the second bullet that struck his arm, fracturing his right ulnar bone. The third bullet was the fatal shot. It entered his chest, passing through his fifth rib, his right lung, through his liver, and then lodged in his back. This bullet caused him to go into shock and then bleed to death before anyone could help him. Early that next morning, one of the teams of men searching, led by Mark Karstens, who was a good friend of the sheriff, spoke with a Sibley County farmer who said two men had stopped there for drinking water earlier that day. The dew was thick that morning and they could see a trail headed south away from the farm. They started to follow the trail and continued for about two and a half miles before coming to a wheat field where they could see someone had entered the wheat field on foot. With the help of another local farmer, they continued to follow what appeared to be fresh trails in search of the shooters. As they continued, they were unaware that Musgrove and Singmars were hiding under some brush just 30 feet from them as they went by. Karsten's posse continued for about three miles, where they met up with another posse who joined them in the hunt. Now, they stopped to eat at a place called Muck Creek before being approached by another farmer who reported seeing the two men creeping along some low land towards Schilling's Lake. The posse took off towards the lake and were able to see the two men running into the bushes. As the posse got closer to the banks of the creek, they could now see Singmars and Musgrove crawling through the reeds towards the water. They watched as the two men entered the water and started swimming, with just their heads showing above the water. As soon as one of the posse members fired towards the two, several others started shooting at the two swimmers. Karsten yelled at everyone to cease fire, and they stopped. But just as fast as they did, one posse member fired a shot, and everyone started firing again. As bullets rained around them, Sigmars and Musgrove shouted, We surrender! They put their hats on sticks, held them up in the air, and waved them at the men and told them, They surrender! They surrender! The two fugitives then walked out of the water with their hands in the air and gave themselves up. As you can imagine, tensions were high, and many in the posse just wanted to simply lynch the two cop killers right on the spot. But even though they had killed his good friend, Karsten put himself between the fugitives and the heated mob and ordered them to stand down. 
Justice would be done the proper way, and Musgrove and Sigmars were placed on a wagon and driven to Glencoe, where they would be booked into the county jail. News traveled fast in Glencoe that the sheriff's killers had been captured. Singmars and Musgrove were held at the jail while the city streets came alive with the townspeople who wanted to see the men who killed their sheriff. The crowd continued to build with many shouting to lynch the killers. The mayor at that time was Mayor Payne and he became increasingly anxious about the mood of the expanding mob and its violent threats. Concerned that alcohol was adding fuel to the fire so to speak, he even ordered the local bars to be closed and locked. The mob grew from people across the county, and several men who were not residents of McLeod County yelled to encourage the mob to get ropes, proceed into the jail, and lynch the two. The men outside who were from Glencoe didn't want to see that happen and tarnish the reputation of their town, and they worked their way through the angry crowd, encouraging them to let the law take its course. City officials, like City Attorney Frank Allen, told the crowd that they should not take the law into their own hands, that he would do everything in his power to make sure these killers would pay for their crimes. At one point, Sheriff Rogers' father, John Rogers, even stepped out from the building where his son's body was being kept, pleading with the crowd to stop and keep quiet until Joe was laid to rest. Then he said, Then you may do what you please. Sheriffs from several surrounding counties came to help guard the outside of the jail, and as it started to get dark, the angry mob's mood escalated again. This prompted city officials to send a telegram to the governor, asking for his help, requesting assistance from a state militia to help keep the peace. The state sent Captain Ed Bean and Company D 1st Infantry of the National Guard to Glencoe to assist with security. Traveling by special train to Glencoe, arriving in town at around midnight and then marching soldiers toward the jail, pushing back the angry mob. Officials agreed that with this mob, it wasn't safe to keep Singmars and Musgrove in Glencoe, so they moved the prisoners by train to St. Paul. As they boarded the train and departed, the angry mob was fuming at the sight of their sheriff's killers being taken away. While an inquest was being held to determine the cause of Sheriff Rogers' death in Glencoe, Singmars and Musgrove, in separate cells in the Ramsey County Jail, spoke with a newspaper reporter admitting to killing Rogers, but arguing that the murder was not premeditated. Their accounts of the confrontation with the farmer and the sheriff were, of course, much different than told by other witnesses, insisting that they pulled their guns to try and convince the sheriff to let them go, and only by accident fired on him during the confrontation. Sheriff Rogers' funeral was the largest McLeod County had ever seen, with over 2,000 people attending and paying respects to this fallen law enforcement officer. A special train from Hutchinson also brought more than 200 people who were either personal friends of Sheriff Rogers or people who belonged to the same secret societies that he did. There was also representation from all surrounding towns as well. Services were held in City Hall, which could only fit about half of the attendees, but it was the biggest building in town, and the procession to City Hall was nearly a mile long. In the days and weeks following the murder of Sheriff Rogers, the locals lost any tolerance they may have had for vagrants. The Glencoe Enterprise reported that just 24 hours following Rogers' murder, there were 27 tramps gathered and held in local lockups. Some from the group that hunted down Singmars and Musgrove even tarred and feathered two of the tramps that had threatened and assaulted a local couple. Roads leading to Glencoe now had coffin-shaped signs stating no tramps allowed in this town by order of the Vigilance Committee. A skull and crossbones were later added to these signs to leave a stronger impression. It took nearly two months for a grand jury to be seated, and then eventually 23 men from every part of the county were seated on this grand jury. Just a day or two before the hearing, both men would be returned to McLeod County by the new sheriff, Sheriff Sandman. During the grand jury testimony, Deputy Link testified that at the time of the first shot, Singmars and Musgrove were about eight or nine yards away. He said when Sheriff Rogers stepped back and pulled out his revolver, one of the suspects said, blaze away, and then both shot at the sheriff. Singmars with his revolver and Musgrove with his rifle, and the sheriff turned and then went down. 
which is when Link went for help while he said at least three more shots were sent his way by the two as he ran his buggy down the roadway. Sigmars and Musgrove claimed that they just wanted to draw first on the sheriff to get him to leave them alone, basically. They said they didn't want to be arrested. Sigmars claimed he tried to shoot the gun out of the sheriff's hand and had no intentions of killing him or even hurting him. Musgrove claimed that his rifle accidentally went off when he was putting it down and that he also never intended to fire on the sheriff. It took the grand jury only three hours to deliberate, and they returned a judgment on August 20th, 1896, in the McLeod County Courthouse, indicating both men were being indicted for first-degree murder. The judgment read that Singmars and Musgrove did willfully, feloniously, justifiably, without excuse, without the authority of law, with malice, aforethought, and with a premeditated design to affect the death of a human being. In their regular trial, their defense attorney requested a change of venue, saying that the two would not get a fair trial in McLeod County. The judge denied that motion. They argued that both should be tried separately, and that request was granted. 248 men were questioned over three days to select 12 jurors, all whom were local farmers. Musgrove was tried first, and during the trial, they continued to claim the guns went off by accident. They also claimed that they didn't know Rogers was an officer and that he didn't tell them anything about a warrant for their arrest. In the end, the jury found Musgrove guilty of murder in the second degree. Musgrove would now have to sit until Singmars was tried. It was determined that it would be too problematic to secure a jury for Singmar's trial, so a change of venue was granted, and it was determined he would be tried in Scott County. He and Musgrove would remain in McLeod County Jail until after Singmar's trial, and then both men would be sentenced, and that sentence would be executed. It was Sunday, September 6th, 1896. Back then, the county jailer who took care of the jail and those in the jail lived in the house connected to the jail. The jailer back then was Edward Waddle, and his family had living quarters downstairs in the house. Pretty simple setup. On the main floor, there were two rooms. There was a kitchen and a parlor separated from the jail by a hallway. Then you walked upstairs, and there were three bedrooms. Shortly after midnight, Waddle heard a quiet knock on his kitchen door. Curious as to who would be stopping at this time of night, he opened the door and was surprised by a large group of men, faces covered with dark masks. The men forced themselves through the door and demanded he give them the keys to the jail door where Musgrove and Singmars were being held. The jailer initially refused, but when one of the men, holding a sledgehammer, threatened to break down the door if he didn't hand over the keys immediately, he agreed to provide the keys and said that they were upstairs in his bedroom. His wife Mary and their two young daughters were hiding in the bedroom under the covers. The man ordered Mary to retrieve the keys, which were kept in a cigar box on the dresser. The mob then took the keys and tied Waddle to a chair on the main floor. The mob then used the keys to enter the jail. They were then confronted by the jail guard, Adolf Hops. Musgrove and Sigmars heard the intruders ordering Hops to give them the padlock keys to their cell door. Hops pleaded with them, saying, Think of what you're going to do. The day will come when you will regret your actions here tonight. Let the law take its course. Several men held Hops, while the man with the sledgehammer, not waiting for the keys, proceeded to break the bolts that hinged the cell doors to the frames of both sides. Once the doors were open, several men went in and grabbed Musgrove and Sigmars, where they were crouched together in their cells. Musgrove and Sigmars prayed and begged for mercy. They also pled that they would be allowed to write a brief message to their families. They were dressed, gagged, and their hands tied behind their backs. One-inch ropes were placed over their heads and tightened around their necks. The mob led them out of the jail, out the front doors, and then south down Ives Avenue. Then, after three blocks, they marched west on Hennepin Avenue, then south again for another block before they reached the Buffalo Creek Bridge. This was the same bridge that Sigmars and Musgrove crossed when they left Glencoe. It's also the same bridge that Sheriff Rogers crossed to find and arrest them. Once on the bridge, the ropes were tied to the railings of the bridge, and Sigmars and Musgrove were raised up over the sides of the bridge. Sigmar's on the east side and Musgrove on the west, and they were tossed over. 
Singmars and Musgrove died in the bridge. The two were dead, and the vigilantes dispersed as silently as they came. Back at the jail, Hops freed Waddle after the mob left, and then they went directly to Sheriff Sandman's home and reported the incident. Shortly after that, it didn't take the sheriff long. He found the hanging bodies of Singmars and Musgrove swaying in the night off the Buffalo Creek Bridge. The bodies were cut down, loaded into the wagon, and then taken to the morgue for an inquest the following day. At the morgue, it was determined that the only violence suffered by the two men was their broken necks from the hanging. The penalty for lynchers back then was murder in the first degree, and rumors freely floated about the region that the lynching must have been planned and possibly since the murderers were found. The Glencoe Enterprise editorialized that some of the residents didn't have faith that the law would take the proper course. According to the newspaper, for the care with which all the preparations were made clearly indicate that the lynching was the result of the deliberate plan of someone or an organization of men, yet unidentified. Newspapers from around the region, actually from around the country, shared the news of the lynching with many people taking sides on both sides of the aisle with this crime. Now, even the New York Times covered the story. Many people agreed with the lynching. They believed it was just and that they were safer because of it, while others argued that the citizens should never have taken the law into their own hands. Many of those condemning the lynch mob, however, said they did not wish to see them punished. Even though there were an estimated 25 to 30 men involved in this act, in this tight-knit community, nobody came forward, and nobody would identify those involved. A reward was never posted for information leading to the lynchers' identity, and a grand jury was never held on the crime. 39-year-old Sheriff Joseph Rogers had served as the McLeod County Sheriff for just about two years. Before that, he'd been a marshal of Glencoe for seven years. Joseph Rogers was survived by his mother, father, and sister, and is buried in Hillcrest Cemetery in Glencoe, Minnesota. It was on the 25th anniversary of the Glencoe lynchings that retired McLeod County Sheriff Scott Raymond and the county's historical society rekindled this dark chapter in their county. Sheriff Raymond compiled a very well-researched 200-page book on the slaying of his predecessor, Sheriff Rogers, and the lynchings that followed. Sheriff Raymond explained that when he went to the McLeod County Historical Society inquiring about the killings, the volunteers started giving him all the news articles and the pictures, and the project really grew from there. Sheriff Raymond's book is entitled The Midnight Gavel of Judge Lynch, and it was the primary resource for this episode. If you're a regular listener of this podcast, you know that I love history, and I thought this book was really interesting, especially if you're into the history of that era, or especially if you're interested in history of that part of Minnesota, McLeod County or Glencoe or, you know, anywhere in that region. We've done a number of late 1800 stories and early 1900 stories, but never have been able to find the documentation and the photos that Sheriff Raymond was able to find and share in his book. Photos of most of the people involved, even photos from drawings, I thought they were interesting. These drawings were recovered from Singmars and Musgrove's cells. They were sketches that they made of the prosecuting attorney, Frank Allen, and also drawings of their attorney, Irwin. So, super interesting from a historical standpoint, so I really highly recommend you check out this book. Again, it's called The Midnight Gavel of Judge Lynch. According to Brian Haynes, executive director of the County Historical Society, he said that it was almost hysteria back then when this took place. He said that though it was nearing the end, the Old West was still alive in the heart of McLeod County on that cool September evening in 1896. And based on this story, that's very true. You can see some of Sheriff Raymond's pictures on our website and find out more on how you can order his book in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thank you for spending the time to listen, learn about, and honor the memory of this fallen hero. Make sure you take the time to thank your local law enforcement for their service and their sacrifice. And don't forget to thank their families too. They also sacrifice so much for our safety. It's up to us to help ensure the sacrifices made by these fallen heroes and by their families are never forgotten. So please share this podcast with family and friends. Until next time, 
This is the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. I'm Scott Rose. Thanks for listening.